Hello, and welcome to an exciting journey through the eyes of Marvin and Bernard Kalb, two of the most respected broadcast journalists of our time. Over a period of 70 years, these two brothers reported some of the world's most historic events and witnessed firsthand some of our nation's most turbulent moments. Marvin Kalb was a diplomatic correspondent for CBS and NBC News for 30 years. In the 1980s, he anchored Meet the Press. He also anchored the Kalb Report, a quarterly broadcast from the National Press Club, emphasizing journalistic ethics and practice. He has authored and co-authored 14 books, including his most recent, The Road to War, Presidential Commitments Honored and Betrayed. Today, Marvin Kalb is a senior advisor to the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting and senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. He is a professor of journalism at Harvard University. Bernard Kalb started as a reporter and columnist for the New York Times before he branched out into TV journalism at CBS and NBC News. He was a foreign correspondent for 15 years covering Southeast Asia during the Vietnam War. Bernard Kalb's career as a journalist took him to locations around the world, including Washington, Moscow, Beijing, Saigon, Paris, Antarctica, and many places in between. These two brothers have some wonderful stories to tell that will be both entertaining and educational. So sit back and prepare to take a journalistic journey as the Johns Hopkins Osher School of Lifelong Learning and Montgomery College's TV and radio students proudly present The Brothers Kalb, Here, There, and Everywhere, a lecture series that recounts the globe-trotting professional experiences of Marvin and Bernard Kalb. CBS News diplomatic correspondent Marvin Kalb. The Pope slumped, hit by two reduces the risk of war. Do you agree or disagree? me for the last time. Marvin Cal, CBS News. Um, I'm Marvin and he's Bernie. And we are two reporters who cover the Cold War from different sides of that war but we were often there when there were large events taking place. And we did speak about the Cuban Missile Crisis last week, and this week we're going to be speaking about the Vietnam War. And I want to start with a quote by Robert McNamara, Secretary of Defense. I don't think my thinking was changing. He was asked a very simple question, whether during the course of the Vietnam War his thinking had changed. And his answer was, I don't think my thinking was changing. We were in the Cold War, and this was a Cold War activity. In other words, the entire Vietnam War ought to be seen within the context of the Cold War and in the minds of an American policymaker, very much an activity <clears throat> in the Cold War, <clears throat> an activity that led to the deaths of more than 58,000 Americans and probably two million Vietnamese. And we find ourselves now, the United States and Vietnam, engaged in a rather torrid romance, as both have discovered each other in an unspoken alliance against this big country up north called China. And during the Vietnam War, I spent most of my time covering it either from the State Department or the White House, and my brother covered it at the battlefront. And what I want to ask him to do right now is tell us a story. Uh, Vietnam and me. I made my first trip to Vietnam long before all of you in this room was born. <laughs> my first visit to Vietnam was 1956. So if you do the calculations, you know where I am on the calendar. And Marvin talked about me a second ago. Let me make one thing clear at the very outset if you start to think about Marvin and me. Marvin is younger, but I'm shorter. <laughs> and so it's, so it's worked out very, very well. 
I made my first trip to, to Vietnam in 1956 as a young reporter, barely literate for the New York Times. We were swearing in at that particular point, that is the country of Vietnam, was swearing in No Dinh Diem as the president of Vietnam. That was 1956. In seven years, he would be assassinated in Vietnam as being a hindrance to the most successful momentum of the war in Vietnam. I reported politically what was taking place in Vietnam, although frankly, when I went to CBS uh, after my New York Times days, when I went to CBS, CBS, like all the networks, had mostly interest in bang bang, which we called bang bang with the war stories. If you did an on-camera political thoughtful piece, the kind I'm famous for, uh, it wasn't always a guarantee to get on the air because bang bang always superseded that. And after 1956, I spent lots and lots of years in and out of Tell Vietnam. Tell me a story. I will get to the story in a minute. Uh, when I was at CBS, we had, there was a situation where two or three of us were based permanently in Asia, I being one of them, and occasionally somebody would come out of New York, say Dan Rather, they would come out for a six-month six stay. I said six minutes almost. The six-month stay, whereas we, based in Asia, would go in and out of Vietnam every other month, except that every other month doesn't add up to six. It usually added up to eight or nine because there was a Tell crisis a story. at one point or another. During the period of covering the war, you inevitably had to go out on combat missions. No fun. You had to fly lots of helicopters. No fun, particularly if you have uh, hydrophobia, whatever it's called, agrophobia. Uh, and so there I was. When I, Marvin says, try to isolate a single story. It's very difficult to do that about Vietnam. <clears throat> okay, then I'll go. I, just a minute. <clears throat> I, I have actually never left Vietnam. I've been there, I, if you do the arithmetic on my in and out stays, I guess I was there three or four years during the war. It would probably come to something of that. But I've been back many times. I, mostly I go to Hanoi because I prefer that Hanoi to Saigon and I can't recommend it enough to be included on any itinerary you have in Asia, Hanoi. But Vietnam is contagious. If you have served in Vietnam, particularly soldiers, I imagine, but I'm thinking about myself and other reporters. In fact, we to this day have a link. We reporters who served all around the world and keep in touch with each other. I gave you telling, your chance. Telling <laughs> each story. other what was that. Well, I'll tell you a story, okay. What it was like, what it was like, for example, we are on a road in Cambodia. We hear at our hotel, the Nam Penh Hotel in downtown, uh, in downtown Nam Penh. Has anybody stayed at the Royale Hotel in Nam Penh? No one I, enables me to speak with even greater authority. We were, <laughs> something was taking place down the road and we got our CBS crew, crew together and we began to chase the war, which is what we did. We chased the war wherever we could get a bit of bang bang and use the bang bang to tell what was happening in Vietnam to you at the other end of the television screen. And we were driving along and suddenly we were stopped by uh, a, a Cambodian military officer. You cannot go past this point because right, you know, 150 yards, 100 yards away from here, there is live fire going on and we don't want you to go to this point. As a reporter, you face a dilemma. That's the picture you want especially if you're in television, and you're faced with this crisis constantly, this moral crisis of employing your sanity not to expose yourself too dangerously, but pressured, particularly by New York, asking, where is the bang bang? Where is the bang bang? Enough of your politics. Where is the bang bang story? And this went on constantly as a challenge whenever you went out on a combat mission. How far does a reporter go? And as you know, some reporters were killed, some reporters simply vanished. Uh, Errol Flynn's son went on a motorcycle one day and we never heard from him again. Uh, people just vanished in the great jungle moor of Vietnam. And so you are constantly balancing access, closeness, set up against the danger and whether you could get out. I remember one time in Cambodia, one more story, Marvin. No, that's enough. I'll, I'll let you have a chance later. I'll let. <laughs> Right, another story. <laughs> <clears throat> One time in, in Cambodia, when the United States in, went into Cambodia, it was called an, an incursion. It was more than that. It was heavy, a heavy entry into Cambodia. This was in 1970, looking for the Viet Cong 
and the North Vietnamese Kosvin, the chief of command center, they went in there, they never found it, etc. But during that particular period, the animosity between the Vietnamese and the Cambodians erupted in a very, very violent way. And dead bodies of any Vietnamese, of Vietnamese living in Cambodia, were thrown into the river, the Mekong River, and there were periods where you saw body after body, the Cambodians reacting to the war in Vietnam, particularly with the American invasion. So we went down to take a look at this. We went down to a center where we heard the killing was taking place. And we got what we thought was our story. It's sort of a ghoulish thing. You reach in on the corpses and the horror of it all, and you extract what turns out to be a minute or a minute 15. It's something, it's something. You come up with your own adjective, and I'll give you a choice of obscene, immoral, invasive, whatever you like, or necessary as well. And, the, uh, and one of the reporters, Sam Anson, who since wrote a book about it, said, I'm going to spend that. We were going back to, Campo, uh, to Phnom Penh. And Sam said, I want to spend the day here with them. Leave me here, because I want to see what will happen. I want, to have, I want to be an eyewitness to any further killing Cambodians or Vietnamese. And I, being the oldest person there, and we were, I was always the oldest person everywhere, I said, Sam, you cannot stay here. They will kill you overnight. They're not going to have any eyewitnesses. They don't want any. He said, no, no, I've got to see this for myself. And we had this ultimate existential debate, Q&A between us. I said, you cannot stay. There were five or six of us. I said, we're all going back. You cannot stay here alone. You must not. And we went through a bit of agony of an exchange. And Sam ultimately yielded to my suggestion that he not stay. And he wrote a book, and if you're interested, you can find this in this book, about the compulsion of reporters to be eyewitnesses to history. And of course, we want to be at times. And sometimes they're maddeningly, irresponsibly dangerous to stay on. And yet, reporters were being killed in Vietnam captured POWs in Vietnam, just like others held in captivity. So uh, no journalistic picnic. But of course, it was a living room war. It was the television's first living room war. In, which, in what took place that day, as I share this with you, was wrapped up on film, put on a, in a pouch, no tape in those days. So you had to wait a day and a half of these very exciting romantic adventures. And off it flew to New York, if it made all the connections, and you were really hoping people would forward the, the bag of film. And sometimes it was late. And I can give you many late instances, but Marvin is impatient. Thank you for that story. <laughs> that story really the beginning of the Cold War. And I want to talk about that for a few minutes. Um, <clears throat> when World War II ended, most Americans believed that we were finished with war. We had done it. We had used two nuclear weapons against Japan, and we were trying very hard to put all of that behind us. But the world kept catching up, sort of, um, biting at us, uh, even when we didn't want it. And it caught up with us in many different ways. The most important fact to bear in mind is that when the war ended, Europe was split. As Bernie mentioned last week, it was split. That split was articulated by Winston Churchill at Fulton, Missouri, in a speech in 1946. And that Iron Curtain really separated not only Europe, but separated the world. And we entered a period called the Cold War. And that period went from the middle 1940s until December 1991, when the Soviet Union disintegrated. And now we are left with the wreckage of Russia. In that period of time, there were two superpowers both armed to the teeth with nuclear weapons, each extremely jealous of the other, each suspicious of the other, each believing that if the other occupies an additional two inches of space, that's bad for us. And it led to a point where the thinking was riveted only on the Cold War. 
and everything became, as McNamara said a moment ago, an activity of the Cold War. Um, Truman was extremely concerned after the end of World War II with the movement of Soviet forces from East towards Central Europe. And if you listen to what the Russians were saying, they intended to hold on to that territory. And the United States, especially the president, became extremely anxious that Russia would be able to move communism into countries like Italy in Southern Europe and France to the West. And in 1948, in two elections, there was proof that there was good reason for Truman to be upset because in these elections in France, 43% of the French people voted for the French Communist Party, and in Italy it was 38%, yeah. and there was the feeling that even through the ballot, not just through the Red Army activity, the Communists were simply gonna take over all of Europe, and Truman <clears throat> would not hear of it. And so in 1947, there was the Truman Doctrine, and that meant that the US would send economic assistance and the beginning of military supplies to Greece and Turkey. And Truman said at that time that this is intended to stop the spread of communism. It was articulated. It was American policy. In 1948, we established NATO, West European Alliance. Why? To stop the communists from moving forward. In 1949, at the end, two things happened. The Chinese communists took power on the mainland of China. And suddenly, if you were in Washington and you were looking at a map, and I remember when I was in the Army, it came a couple of years after that, and we were thinking about the Red Menace. And everything was colored by that. Everything you saw, everything you understood, was part of a feeling of incipient war, of a shadow of war hanging over many of our activities, if we took any of this seriously. And I think a lot of us did. And the people who took it most seriously were the <laughs> leaders in the country, and in particular, President Truman. When China went communist at the end of 1949, that was a moment when, in Washington, in the administration, people began to talk about building up allies with military strength and American hardware wherever in the world there was a threat of communism. When the Chinese took over, our mindset, our strategic mind was split between what was going on in Europe <clears throat> and what suddenly was going on in Asia. And several months later, in June of 1950, the North Koreans, communists, moved into South Korea. Truman at that point felt he had no option but to send American forces to Korea to stop the communists from going any further. In 1945, when Harry Truman took over, he promised his former colleagues in the Senate that if he ever sent American forces anywhere in the world, it would only be with the consent of Congress. In June of 1950, he totally ignored Congress and found his authority in a UN Security Council resolution. He sent uh, what amounted to eight divisions into South Korea. We almost lost that war. But General MacArthur, in a very clever move at the Incheon Peninsula, Turn the course of battle around, and the U.S. ultimately won, but there were two years of, of those pointless, endless negotiations of a stalemate. And the reporters said, all of these people who die for a tie. And it was a, a painful moment, but it introduced something brand new into American calculation. And that was, after World War II, we always felt that we could do whatever we wanted. The United States was so powerful, one of the two superpowers. We had all of this great economic strength, military hardware left over from World War II. 
Nobody was going to mess with us. Suddenly, the North Koreans come in, and we can't beat them. We have to settle for a tie. Truman, at this time, did not have Vietnam in his mind at all. But what he saw was the French wanted to reimpose French colonial rule in Indochina. Truman didn't like it. He told the French time and time again not to do it. The French did it. And because we wanted the French in the fight against the Russians, we allowed them to go back into Indochina. And we got hooked up in Indochina with a number of people who were not Democrats in any way and uh, the wrong people. But the wrong people were on our side. They were not communist. The communists were led by Ho Chi Minh. He was a very astute revolutionary leader. And he had the support of his people. Many times support won as a result of a cruel imposition of his own ideas. But he was the leader, clearly. There was no such leader in the South. And the French took over as, as best they could, but they weren't doing terribly well. And in 1954, in the battle of the Ambien Phu, they lost. Who then was left to pick up the tattered banner of France? Thank you very much, the United States of America. President Eisenhower has gotten away with murder, in a sense, in his policy in Vietnam. Because if you look back and you say, how did we ever get into that place? When did it start? It started in a way with Harry Truman, but it was Eisenhower in two ways. One, in the 1954 Geneva Convention Conference, Eisenhower had a choice. Number one, we didn't have to go at all, but we felt we had to go, and we sort of took a back seat. We were not enthusiastic about that negotiation. But at the end of the day, the deal was that the piece of Indochina that was called Vietnam would be divided in two, across the 17th parallel. And there'd be the part in the north and the part in the south. Within a matter of days, the communists in the north proclaimed a new country. <clears throat> Cold War, what do we do? We take the south and proclaim it a new country. And we call it, it was called, by the way, the territory of South Vietnam. But then we christened it in the US. We christened it South Vietnam. Now, since South Vietnam became the newest member of what we used to call the free world, that meant that it was entitled to all of the benefits of the free world. And those benefits were defined by activities that the United States did. We provided the money, and we provided the beginning of a number of troops that we called advisors who would go in to advise the South Vietnamese. Eisenhower, in other words, created South Vietnam and gave it all of the dignity of a nation by giving it a flag and a president, et cetera. But it was never really a total country. But by our, our activities, we endowed it with the virtues of sovereignty. In 1959, Eisenhower delivered a speech at Gettysburg College. And in that speech, and I won't be able to give it to you word for word, but it's awfully close to this. Eisenhower said at that time, the continued existence of a free, independent, non-communist South Vietnam is in the direct national security interests of the United States. Now that language is magic, and it covers a great deal. And what it covered in this case was our commitment, because of our national interest, to the security of South Vietnam, the preservation of South Vietnam, 
as a free, independent, non-communist country. That became our responsibility. We assumed it at that time. And when John Kennedy came in, in January 1961, and we will in a couple of weeks celebrate, if that's the right verb, commemorate the 50th anniversary of his assassination. But when John Kennedy took over, Eisenhower told him, we cannot afford to lose any part, any part of, of Southeast Asia, of, of what was French Indochina. He even said to Kennedy, you may have to move troops into Laos in order to save it. And Kennedy, when he took over, said he did not want to send troops into Laos. But South Vietnam, he was determined to save. And that's when we began to move advisors in. And when Kennedy was killed, Lyndon Johnson took over. And Lyndon Johnson, in my mind, would have been one of our greatest presidents were it not for the Vietnam War, which ultimately destroyed him. But at that time, Linda Johnson said, let us continue. And in his memoir, he said he was very proud of two things. One, that he continued Kennedy's policies in Vietnam. And two, that it led to what was called the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, which gives American presidents the authority to use all military force in defense of American national interest in Southeast Asia. And that, of course, opened the door to the Vietnam War, which we will now discuss. And what I would appreciate very much is we have some tape that leads into an understanding of the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. I can review this. It's worth reviewing. On August 2nd, 1964, there was one U.S. destroyer off the coast of North Vietnam, the USS Maddox. It was attacked. There is the evidence for it. Lyndon Johnson was in the midst of a presidential campaign. He was president because um, by this time an almost sainted predecessor had been killed. He wanted his own legitimacy, which any politician would want. He didn't feel that responding immediately to these attacks on August 2nd represented him as a man of peace. He was running against Barry Goldwater, and he kept on portraying Goldwater, with some good justification, by the way, as a man who would have gone to war immediately. He was staunchly anti-communist, very much caught up in the spirit of the Cold War, and wanting to, to attack if there's any kind of danger to the U.S. And Johnson figured he wanted to be distinct from Goldwater, so he didn't do anything. Two days later, on August 4th, having added another, another destroyer to the location, there was the Maddox and now the Turner Joy. The two of them were there. Suddenly, out of the blue, the commander of the Maddox, an experienced Navy captain, named Herrick, began to send messages to Washington saying we're under attack. There was no attack. James Stockdale, who was a pilot and who then, some of you may remember the name, he was um, the vice president in the 1988 or 92. Candidate. Uh, candidate, right. Um, but he was at that time a pilot, a Navy pilot. And I talked to him, and, and he was saying, I just flew over this area. I could see everything. He said, they told me to shoot and fire, so I shot and fired at nothing. He said, I'm a good soldier. They told me to shoot, I shot. But there was nothing there. And then Herrick said, you know, I think the sonar man got this all bollocked up. And it turned out to have been a total mistake. McNamara, in this film that you saw from the mid-1990s, portrayed himself as a man who tried, he said, very hard to figure out what was going on all day. He knew what was going on all day. 
he conveyed an impression that there was an attack. And after he conveyed an impression, he told the president that there was an attack. And the president, believing, Secretary of Defense says this, there was an attack, I better do something about it. In the middle of a campaign, he didn't want to be accused of being soft on communism. So he ordered a counterattack. Before he did, he had a conversation with George Ball, who was one of the leaders at the State Department. And he said, I'm sending uh, these guys off to bomb North Vietnam. Our first attack against North Vietnam, opening the door to the entire war. I know that it was the sonar man. It was no attack. But he did it anyway. And that, you can call it a lie, that whatever you want to call it, conveyed to the American people, opened a pattern of relationship between the government of the United States <clears throat> and the war and the people that ended up consisting of one misstatement, misjudgment, misunderstanding after another. And we paid a terrible price for it. Bernardo. We organized this class so we could sort of personalize the headlines of our time, as it were. And I'd like to ask before I deliver a few immortal words. I'd, li I'd like to ask you to create the image, the collective image that came out of the dots you were exposed to. That is the State Department briefings, backgrounders, off the record briefings. What sort of Vietnam emerged as you were sitting there in Washington while I was on a helicopter in Vietnam? Because I think I have a different Vietnam in mind, obviously. But go close up to me now, Marvin. In 1964, I remember very, very clearly that um, there were two reporters. Back up. When the Gulf of Tonkin resolution was sent up to the Congress, 88 senators voted for it, and two senators voted against it, 88 to 2. In the House, it was 416 to nothing voted for the resolution. There was no question about the near unanimity of congressional support for this resolution, giving the president all authority to use American military strength in defend of interest in Southeast Asia. Now, when you looked at that, it was a, to me, it was a terrifying document. And I know that on the evening news that night, Cronkite asked me to do a piece on the resolution. And I thought it, I thought it was very obvious what it was saying was that we're going to war in Southeast Asia. The president has that authority now. This is the equivalent of a declaration of war. And that is what I said. But it turned out. Mm -hmm. that only Murray Marder <clears throat> in the Washington <throat> Post the following morning had the same analysis. And I was stunned because the government kept on saying that we're not going to war. Uh, this is a small little thing. And, and he wa Johnson wanted to convey an impression that was not consistent with the reality um, but that is, the American people were given the impression by the government, with the exception of CBS and the Washington Post, um, that this was, in a sense, a nothing just to take care of the president's political needs at the moment. Marvin used the word, quoting McNamara, as you saw in the film. Oh, well, we didn't show that segment. But he quoted McNamara saying, we were in the midst of a Cold War. The Vietnam War was a Cold War activity. In 1971, Senator Kerry, then not a senator, was a veteran of the war in Vietnam. He had been wounded several times, received several medals, appeared at a committee he hearing in Washington, in which he said, and I was very careful to get the exact words here, he asked, how do you ask a man to be the last man to die in Vietnam? How do you ask a man to be the last man to die for a mistake? 
You have McNamara talking about a Cold War activity, the war in Vietnam. A returning veteran hero of the war in Vietnam describes the war as a mistake. It was more than a mistake. It was a horrible blunder. It was foreign policy based on ignorance and arrogance. You know, in all my years in Vietnam and the contagious, memorable years, ineradicable, unerasable, I always make the point that in many, many wars that America has been in, we have soaked up a bit of the local culture. In Vietnam, America never learned how to say thank you in Vietnamese. The whole war went on year after year. There were no thank yous. A simple word in Vietnam, Vietnam come on, come on, C-A-M-O-N is thank you in Vietnamese. And it was unnecessary because Marvin and I once had lunch with Bui Ziem, former ambassador of South Vietnam, the last ambassador from the South to the United States. And he confirmed and shared with us what those of us who had been in Vietnam year after year knew was a fact. The Vietnamese were in our way of what we would believe is a certain victory. There was a hubris an arrogance and unacceptability to accept the limits of power. That we were America, we had done what we had to do in World War II. True, if you want to raise the question, we fought to a draw in Korea, over 30,000 dead, three year war. But nevertheless, there was in the psyche of Americans an inevitability of triumph. That it was inconceivable, unacceptable for anything short of victory to make up the American psyche. So one man calls it a creativity, which is a glorious word filled with rubber, which you can elastize in any way you want. And a fellow who was in the war, Kerry, says, how do you ask a man to be the last man to die for a mistake? Marvin has given you the context of the Cold War. And essentially, what it produced in America was a stampede of anxiety. Wherever you look, there was some sort of communist takeover, some sort of communist victory, some sort of communist thrust. If you do the arithmetic on all of these communist aggressive moves, you get a stampede of anxiety. And not to mention the fact that the fans of anti-communism were flamed by Senator McCarthy. You remember Senator McCarthy? Raise your hand, Senator McCarthy, of course. Well, when you, you've got a very combustible inferno here stampede of anxiety, and then as a result of the missiles, that, the torpedoes that were not there, no doubt about that, I think. Uh, when you think of that, that was 64. One year later, the United States sent the first troops to Vietnam prior, prior one, one moment, prior to, prior to the fact that Kennedy, during his time, had already put 16,000 so-called advisors into Vietnam prior to anything at all. Surreptitiously, quietly, 16,000 Americans went in as advisor, and over that period of time, Kennedy, uh, Kennedy period of time, uh, there was a relaxation of the ground rules in which Americans were allowed to participate in combat, to go beyond their advisory roles, actual participants in combat. I thought just to give you a feel of it, though we lost a little bit of film, and as you, as you know, there's endless tons of film about Vietnam, I'm going to give you, I've asked our fr uh, friend here, Joanne, to give you something that she lost, that I lost, whatever. She's found a little clip of the arrival of the first Marines in the spring of 1965 in the formal entry of the war in Vietnam. That will be followed by three iconic pictures of many that took place in Vietnam. And you'll see the three, and I'll talk about the three. And then I'll talk to you in about 1975. From 65 to 75, although the United States had been helping the French prior to our entry into the war, you know, Marvin, they talked about when the, when the French were defeated at the NBN Fu in 1954. The Americans were terribly anxious about that. And there was talk about using atom bombs, atom bombs, to rescue the French. And Eisenhower said, no dough, no going on that. Eisenhower said, no troops, no atom bombs. Are you mad? So Eisenhower held back the onrush, which he also heard repeated during the Cuban Missile Crisis of 62, the itchy fingers that sometimes the military has when it comes to pulling the trigger. In 1954, at that conference in Paris, I just take, could take a minute to backtrack. At that conference, that's the famous scene, 
where the Chinese, having just taken over the mainland in 1949, you're five years in, we shun the Chinese. We want nothing to do with them, and we encourage the world to shun the Chinese. Zhou Enlai, the premier, is there. Russians, interested parties. Zhou Enlai puts the word out through one diplomat or another. He is prepared to shake the hand of the American Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles. John Foster Dulles says no. A snub that has ricocheted through Chinese history ever since, in 1954. When I was in Beijing in 1960, 1972, I was one of the reporters who went along with Nixon on that opening trip to China, 72. I was waiting for that airplane to open at the airport with Nixon's hand thrust into the sky to grab the same Zhou Enlai offer of a handshake. And boy, did he shake that hand. But this was 72. I'm talking 54 in Paris. And not only that, in 54, the Vietnamese thought they had won the war already prior to the decision to compromise on a vote. And the Soviets and the Chinese betrayed, that's the Vietnamese word, Phan Van Dong, betrayed the Vietnamese by setting the dividing line at the 17th parallel because the North Vietnamese felt that they had already gone down to about the 15th and the 13th parallel. And the, Mer uh, the, then the Russians and the Chinese wanted America out as quickly as possible, so they drew the line, Marvin's showing me the watch, they drew the line at the 17th parallel was an agonizing compromise for the South Vietnamese. 8,286 killed in action Americans or non-combat deaths, 153,000 Americans wounded, about 800 Americans prisoners of war, of which most were freed ultimately and escaped, and about 100 or so died in captivity. The North Vietnamese government said there were 1,100,000 North Vietnamese Army and Viet Cong military personnel killed during the war. The US State Department said the number was more accurately 950,000, et cetera, et cetera. You've got, you've got eight years of war from the arrival of the Marines in March of 1965 to the evacuation in April of 1975. And the war ended April 30th, 1975, although in 1973, the United States had signed an agreement already with the North Vietnamese to end America's military involvement in the war, and it took two years or so for America to withdraw from the war. Among other stories I covered that gives you a sense of the immediacy of what we were doing at that point, I was at Clark Air Base in the Philippines when the first American prisoners that were released in Vietnam were flown on, by a U.S. military aircraft from uh, the air base, in, from the airfield in Hanoi to Clark Air Base in the Philippines. And you may remember those first ex-prisoners arriving here and landing in the States and the family rushing to greet them and so forth. There were hundreds, and the emotion at Clark Air Base was extraordinary, as you can imagine, the human emotions there. But all during that period, and what I wanted to share with you is something about, Marvin talked about the Vietnam that emerged in the United States. And I want to talk a little bit about what the media was like in the United States and the pressures we were under. This, as I said, was the first living room war in which the film arrived a day or so later and you saw what took place yesterday, today. But it always wasn't that easy. It was an uncensored war. That is, I can leave my hotel, run off to Tansanud Airport, and find out what was happening and jump aboard a helicopter and go off to war. Or there was a time during the Tet Offensive when you could jump into a taxi and go to the war. There were, at the beginning, no reporters covering the war at the early days. I think the New York Times sent the first reporter in when there was an attempted and failed coup against No Din Ziem uh, somewhere in the late 60s. But it was so... Late 50s. Late 50s. Late 50s, of course. But, thank you. But, but, uh, but no, no, I'm, I'm, thinking, I'm thinking of a story of, a, of a, a major American news agency. And to save them the embarrassment, I will not mention their name. Assigned a very good friend of ours, Cy Topping, 
to go to Vietnam and they said you ought to proceed to Saigon, Indonesia. <laughs> and I used to occasionally get messages from New York called Hong Kong, China. That was before it was part of China. But Saigon, Indonesia is an interesting imaginative bit of geography. You had the anti-war demonstrations taking place in the United States. You had the reporters on the war, covering the war. And the central clash that took place between the perceptions were, usually took place in places like, for example, the Five O'Clock Follies. The Five O'Clock Follies took place every day in Saigon. This was a gathering of what the military was prepared to share with you, and reporters would come and get up every scrap of information they could. So that today, uh, Colonel Marvin Cal will be at the rostrum telling you about the uh, various problems and the various successes, mind you, and the body count of the enemy right there. And you reporters, 100 or 200 reporters, would take it all down. And essentially, it was a competition for getting at the truth. The US military thought it was telling us the truth. The battlefield was telling us a lot of what they were saying was not the truth. And so you had the clash of war, as it were. The optimistic, what's the phrase, Marvin? Uh, home, we'll be home by Christmas, light at the end of the tunnel, and so forth like that. That was essentially the drumbeat of the official briefing. It sort of sought to avoid em any emphasis on the negative, and there was this cockeyed idea that killing Vietnamese, that is, the, 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 the kill count, was the most critical thing you could do. And so that anything that moved went into that figure of kill today. Anything that moved. And the book came out recently called, uh, called that, uh, Kill Anything That Moves, by a reporter who was there in Vietnam, it just came out recently, pointing up all the difficult moments and the, the, the grasping on the general at Westmoreland to give you impressive numbers hoping that the, how should I say, the fatal liquidation of the other side would eventually force the other side to recognize reality and give up. Can you give me a minute? Take it. Um, on these numbers, very important. Um, in September of 1967, the United States was losing about 30 Americans a week. By the middle of October of 67, we were losing about 150 a week, 150 a week. By December, we were losing more than 350 a week, indicative of the ferocious nature of the war at that time. At the very same time that General Westmoreland was briefing the Congress and talking about the light at the end of the tunnel and in January of 1968 was the great Tet Offensive in which the North Vietnamese with the Viet Cong locally launched attacks throughout the entire country and even got into the U.S. Embassy in Saigon. They were beaten back and they didn't take any papers or anything at the embassy, but they did get in. And it is a fact also that U.S. forces inflicted enormous casualties on the North Vietnamese in the wintertime of 68. And yet, the impression right. in the United States and all over the world was that the North Vietnamese were winning because they had launched this major attack. And at the end of March 1968, many of you will remember Lyndon Johnson getting on television and saying he is not going to run for the president And the adverb, again. Marvin, after he ran through some of the things, it was a marvelous, revealing adverb. After he offered this list of negatives, reality that he was confronted by, he then said, accordingly. Accordingly, he's pulling out. He's not Accordingly, I will, I will step down. And you know, the you know, interesting thing here is... Bernie was talking about imagery. Think about numbers, the way they went up, and then suddenly, in 1968, the American people, <clears throat> given the demonstrations all over the place, were saying to the government, we've had enough of this war, and we want out of this war. And this is, it's so hard 
uh, really to explain why it is that the American people took off. Look at those numbers from September 67 into the Tet Offensive where more than 500 Americans were being killed every week. Right. That's there were in all about 3 million Americans in uniform went through Vietnam during that period between 1965 and 1975. About 3 million. And uh, Marvin, I don't think you hit... Marvin says we have to leave the... Let me just make one point before we take a break. I want to come to the map. Marvin didn't use the word domino theory, did you, Marvin? No, you. I'll use it. <laughs> and you've got, to go, you've got to go to this map. And you've got to think of what I said before, the stampede of anxiety. Communist China, the Soviets suddenly have the bomb, Czechoslovakia, Eastern Europe, the curtain, and so forth. And then you say, we've got to stop it somewhere, because I think it was LBJ who said, uh, they'll be here in San Francisco if we don't stop them here now in their own territory. So there you are in Vietnam. And now you have to think of dominoes, falling dominoes. One of the f pieces of film I was hoping to show was the falling dominoes, one domino after another. The US, the military, the planners of this had come to the conclusion that if Vietnam was lost, unquote, there would be the falling domino effect. The communists would then move into Cambodia, move into Thailand, move into India, just keep going because one domino after another would collapse. They would go down Malaysia here, they would go into Singapore, they would come at the bottom out through Indonesia. Everything would be a falling domino. Anybody who has spent any time in Vietnam knows how ludicrous and empty that is. Now why do I say empty? Because it is. It is empty because if you were living anywhere in Southeast Asia, as I live, my wife and kids, I lived there 15 years. One thing you learn is the nationalism that takes place within those countries that have just shed colonial oversight, colonial oppression. They are now free and they are exultant about their own freedom. And if you think for one moment they're going to be a falling domino, you have to, you have to be colossically, poetically ignorant to come to that conclusion. We don't give up our independence to accommodate an American philosophy that is dead wrong from top to bottom. And what happened? Nobody fell. There was not a single domino that fell. All these countries that were scheduled to fall by the American anticipation, none of them fell. They just stood there, thumbed their nose. They had built up a nationalism and a strength during that period, with American help, of course. But the will to remain independent was extraordinary. Marvin used the word, when we were here the first day, tenacity. 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 The fight, the struggle, the graspable embrace of freedom. And tenacity is worth more than 50 B-52 bombers. B-52s were blasting away in North Vietnam and in the war, but they had tenacity. That was their weapon and their arsenal. I'll tell you a story if I... Tell them what. Uh, well, I think the hour is over, and there's always a ten. Don't hour. interrupt me. Uh, <laughs> one, one story, and then we can clear out about this tenacity. There was a fellow, there was a fellow take this down, because you might want to read this book, called The Perfect Spy by Pham Swan An, A-N. Pham Swan An was somebody I always went to see the minute I returned to Vietnam, because Pham An, we call him An, An would always give me an update on what was happening during my month or so away, tell me about what's going on politically and so forth, what the situation was, and I would get a refresher briefing from An. And all the reporters knew Pham, Pham Swan An. In fact, there was a period when he worked for the Christian Science Monitor, he worked for Time Magazine. Pham Swan An, just terrific. After the war, it turned out that Pham Swan An was a spy. He was a spy for Hanoi. And I would still meet him after the war when this was exposed because I knew his feelings. On, we're sitting in a small cafeteria in Saigon, the Givral. They've taken it down, unfortunately, but it could have been a monument to the reporters in the war. I'm sitting here with On. He's now exposed as a spy. And he knows that reporters who were there can understand that. Because you came in into our country uninvited and gave us all this war. And we wanted to be independent. And I would say, An, what's the crystallization of all your experiences here? He said, what Ho Chi Minh taught us, 
Ho Chi Minh taught us that freedom is precious and independence is precious. And so we had to do everything we can to preserve it. Definition of tenacity. Pham Swan An's son was an interpreter. He's since joined the Vietnamese Foreign Service, but he was an interpreter for the meeting in 19, whenever it was, between, Ameri between President Clinton and the leadership of uh, Vietnamese when he went through. There is, yeah. By the way, An was sent by the Communist Party to the United States prior to the war to learn the cultural values of American journalism so that he, when he went back, he knew the rhythm under which we worked. But this was, in, organ in other words, they thought in advance. And An knew how to record us. When I would say to An at this coffee shop, the Jivral, I say, An, what sort of gibberish did you give me in all my talks with you? He said, I couldn't touch you because you knew too much. I don't mean to flatter myself about this, but there was no other world for me but Vietnam. He said, you, too, you knew too much, and all your reporters knew too much, and that if I were giving you something that was propaganda, you would know what it was. You'd be able to recognize it. So there was no point in, forming, in creating a sort of suicide where my integrity was compromised as you would see me. We hope you enjoyed this edition of The Brothers Kalb, here, there, and everywhere. Join us again next time for an up-close and personal view of the unforgettable events that shaped our nation and the world. And remember, you can always join the conversation on Facebook and Twitter. I'm Mary Kay Shardle Galato, director of the Osher Program at Johns Hopkins University. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time.